if you track women through their uh, ovulation cycle and you show them a picture of a man, the same man, and you do nothing but vary his jaw width, when they're ovulating, the guy with the wider jaw is more attractive, and when they're not ovulating, the farthest away from that, the guy with the thinner jaw is more attractive, and that's associated with testosterone levels. And so women who are fertile like more masculine men, and basically, if you're on the pill, then you're never in that ovulation phase. And so one thing that may have happened, and I don't know this for sure, but it's, it's interesting to consider, is that since women have been taking the birth control pill, their preference for less masculine men has become more pronounced. And that could easily be one of the things that's fueling at least some of the tension that's existed and exists now politically between men and women. But the point is, is that you just cannot ignore the massive consequences of a biological revolution like that and to make any other factor causal when you're trying to understand the political movement, movements, especially in the last, say, 40 years, it's, you're putting the cart before the horse. Now, it's reasonable to point out that the pill wouldn't have been accepted as a technology if certain political changes with regards to the emancipation of women had, hadn't already been in place, right? No one would have even been allowed to do something like investigate contraception. So you can't separate the biological from the political entirely, but it's still... It's still very useful to organize your, organizing your thinking to realize just how profound a, 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 a revolution that was. But the neurological structure isn't exactly the mind, like the neurological structure isn't exactly your consciousness. There's some relationship between them that we don't know. And the unconscious, from a conceptual perspective, is the place that your memories are that you sometimes can get access to and sometimes can't. And so... You might think, well, that there are the memories that you can't get access to. There might be a variety of reasons you can't get access to them. One might be that you've just forgotten them. And one might be that they're so painful that you don't want to bring them to mind. You'll, you'll engage in tricks to stop yourself from getting access to them. And, or maybe there are memories that are so complex that, and painful that even if you did get access to them, you wouldn't exactly know what to do with them. And so there's not a lot of reason for you to bring them to mind because all it is is pain without any, without any utility. And when you understand that a little bit, you understand more about what Freud meant by repression. The thing about Freud is that he kind of believed that, like many people believe now, that when you remember a, an event in the past, it's, it's almost as if you're using a videotape recorder and that when you experience that, the memory is somehow recorded in you like it happened. But that's not a very accurate version of how memory works. I mean, we know that memories can be easily distorted. Um, for example, if you interview someone about an event and you make suggestions that there was something present in the event that wasn't there, and then you bring them back a couple of weeks later and you ask them about the same event, they'll often incorporate the thing that they were told into the event. And so... And the idea that you can make an objective record of something that's happening to you is kind of a strange notion anyways, because, so for example, if you're having an argument with someone and later you're asked what the argument was about and the other person is asked what the argument is about, there's no necessary reason why the accounts will jibe at all, because a lot of time when you're having an argument with someone, you're arguing about what the argument is about right? You say, well, you're angry at me. Well, why? This is why I think you're angry at me. And you say, no, this is why I think this event has occurred. And you're thinking about, especially if we know each other well, you're thinking about the contextualization of that event across our entire history. And I'm doing the same thing. And I'm going to highlight things that you're not going to highlight. And I'm going to draw causal inferences that you're not going to draw. And for us just to get on the same page about the memory is going to be very difficult. So the idea that, in so, especially with complex interactions with people, that you can somehow make a video recording of the memory and actually capture what happens is, is very, very... It's, it's not true. You, you can't. I mean, you might be able to extract out certain objective facts, but, but generally, if it's a dialogical issue, if it's a relationship issue, it spans such a long period of time that just cutting a slice of it out doesn't constitute a reasonable record of, a, of what it means. And that's what you're more concerned with too. Like when, when you have an experience, you're not so much concerned about what happened from an objective perspective. You're more concerned about what the experience means. And then you might ask, well, what does it mean to mean something? And that was the question I was trying to answer in that paper I had.
read right at the beginning of the class, but one of the things that meaning means is that it has implication for the way you look at the world or the way you act in the world. And so if I tell you something meaningful, what that's going to mean is in the future, you're going to act slightly differently or maybe radically differently, depending on how meaning it, meaningful it is, but also that the way that you look at the world has shifted. And the way that you look at the world is actually an unconscious, it's actually an unconscious process. I mean, you don't know while you're looking at the world how it is or why it is that you're looking at the world in that way. I mean, because, well, first of all, it would just be too complicated. And second, you wouldn't be able to concentrate on what was actually going on. So your attention, for example, is mediated by unconscious forces. And you know that, you know that perfectly well. And this is another Freudian observation. You know, if you're sitting down to study, for example, your conscious intent is to study, but you know perfectly well that all sorts of distraction fantasies are going to enter the theater of your imagination non-stop and annoyingly, and, and there isn't really a lot you can do about that except maybe wait it out. You know, so you'll be sitting there reading and your attention will flicker away. You'll think about, oh, I don't know, maybe you want to watch Jane the Virgin on Netflix or something like that, or maybe it's time to have a peanut butter sandwich, or you should get the dust bunnies from un out from underneath the bed. time to go outside and have a cigarette or maybe it's time for a cup of coffee or it's like all these subsystems in you that would like something aren't very happy just to sit there while you read this thing that you're actually bored by and so they pop up and try to take control of your perceptions and your actions non-stop maybe you think well this is a stupid course anyways why do I have to read this damn paper and what am I doing in university and what's the point of life it's like you can really well you can really get going if you're trying to avoid doing your homework and 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 then you might think well what is it in you that's trying to avoid because after all, you took the damn course and you told yourself to sit down. Why don't you listen? <laughs> 